Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am happy to be part of this program this morning, uh, talk, talking about uh, two of the staple crops in Ohio, corn and soybeans, uh, up there in the list. It's a great privilege to uh, be able to share some uh, recommendations that I will have on uh, agronomics for corn management this year. The structure of my presentation, uh, a few steps that I will be taking along the way here. First, I will speak about uh, some sort of case study. That was my most recent research program uh, back in Nebraska with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where we studied abnormal ears yield losses. Then I will jump into applied research and extension, what is my uh, vision and philosophy for this new position here at Ohio State. Uh, I did some uh, revision of what the research is telling us in several relevant agronomical aspects for corn management. I will share some of that. Uh, just recently, I looked at a national corn yield contest article. Uh, I will be sharing a few highlights from that as well in terms of uh, how to achieve high yields. Some Ohio observations that mostly come from the OCPT program, Ohio Corn Performance Testing and uh, take home message at the end. So my first uh, stop here is the case study of abnormal ear development in corn. Um, this might be a new topic for several of you in the audience, but also uh, this might not be a new topic for several of us. Uh, we know that uh, by looking at this title here, understanding corn, corn ear abnormalities can help us to close yield gaps. That's something that we learned in the past several years. Uh, these abnormalities do decrease yield and hence they can negatively affect yield gaps. And as I was just referring to, I don't think that this is a completely new topic for Ohio. This is a abnormal ears poster that uh, Dr. Peter Thomason and his team put together a few years ago. I have seen it uh, well spread around and some of the takeaways from all this situation in abnormal years is that literally more than 100 years of research in corn, the crop is not fully understood yet. Uh, these abnormalities events that we have been seeing, uh, they still happen, they affect productivity, they affect profitability, and uh, there is a need to continue uh, at least doing some work investigating the causes. So that's what put us uh, on board for my, for my research program in Nebraska. And these reports of abnormal years and yield losses were, they were particularly relevant in 2016. Initially, uh, it was thought to be a problem isolated to Nebraska, but that same year or that same crop season, uh, several reports came also from uh, other states that you can see highlighted in this map. And that extended from the Texas Panhandle to Eastern Colorado, Kansas, Iowa, and Illinois. That's all in addition to Nebraska. As always, uh, the university was ready there uh, trying to do some follow up and describing this uh, situation. So an uh, extension article at UNL came out with some of the hypotheses and narrative of what was happening. All this was uh, field level, commercial scale, commercial hybrids that year. Since the beginning that we started to discuss, okay, how, how do we attack this problem? How can we uh, approach this, uh, this situation? We, we understood that we must see it as a result of interactions. We didn't think that a single factor was responsible for all of this. So that includes uh, keeping in mind genetics, environment, and in some cases, management practices that we are uh, putting out in our, in our crop systems. These are the three main groups that were being reported multi years when you have more than one year on that same node. Short hasks, when you have some level of kernel exposure, it can be as bad as a 90% exposure, or it can be as minimum as a 10 or 20% exposure. And then we have barbell ears. Barbell ears are uh, those ears that have some kernel skips in the calf 
uh, at some point. Again, all of this is connected and translated into lower yields and then lower profits. Our objectives were to find the causes, study G by E by N factors, and quantify yield losses. And as you can see here, our approach was a comprehensive um, series of steps that we took together. Some of our research partners are listed here in these uh, institutions, Hogemeyer Seeds, Nebraska Extension, Pioneer Seeds, Water for Food Global Institute. And our six steps are lined up here, and I think that Whatever we did with abnormal ear development in corn, that's also very applicable to other issues in our agronomic community, not only for corn, but also for other crops. The, all the projects started by growers' concerns being reported due to low yields. Then right away, we follow up with some on-farm evaluations that we looked at uh, and quantify how bad these, uh, these, uh, these, the issues were occurring. Sure, we need to always look at the literature. We need to see what is already understood about the topic and try to elaborate from there. We conducted several experimental research trials looking at different practices of corn management during uh, 2018 through 2020. We added some control environment experiments. In some instances, what we have out in the field might not suffice to answer the questions that we might have. So we need to consider these conditions. And then we have been working on the outcomes for the last uh, one or two years. Uh, so the work that we did in Nebraska, again, was responding to those issues being um, um, a concern. And then our work was mostly uh, focused in central and eastern Nebraska. A few pictures here of what we were seeing out there in the field, multi-ears, barbell ears, and short husk ears. One of our first steps was conducting and working on a field survey. So more than a thousand plants were collected and uh, were analyzed. And this was coming from 15 farmer fields uh, in uh, eastern and central Nebraska. And what you see here in the x-axis are all those fields, 15, and they are grouped in two categories, affected and checked. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage of ear abnormalities in those fields. You can see that in the affected fields, we had 10 of them. And in, in the worst case scenario, there was a field with almost 50% of ear abnormalities. That is almost every other plant. Whether check fields were fields that were being reported as highly problematic, but you know what? After we were out there and conducted our assessments, uh, the numbers came to be uh, quite low, 5%, 3% of abnormalities. In overall, uh, from all the fields summary, 78% were normal, 22% of ears were abnormal. Now, we can think if 22 is a whole lot or not, and this graph can help us to answer that question. So when you have normal years here on the brown bar, you see that the grain weight per plant is close to 200 grams. Now, when you have any type of abnormal years, your grain, norm, grain weight per plant is being affected significantly. And if you do some uh, rounding up here, it's about 65% of yield losses in those affected years. So if you do 65% times 22%, you can have some idea what are the issues happening. And then even worse, if you are in a condition like this one with 50% of abnormalities. So this sets the stage for our, for our work in the subsequent years. And uh, this is one of our first projects we were looking at multiple commercial hybrids. We were uh, conducting experiments in different environments, uh, locations and years, different planting dates as uh, one of the main practices of management. Close to 3000 plants were individually uh, evaluated for this work at the plant level. And don't worry about the details on this table, but red cells indicate that there was a statistical significance and the measurements that we were working on included internal length, ear height or ear placement, ear node, and grain yield per plant. 
Uh, what is important here is that there was a strong significance for almost every variable, suggesting that some potential diagnostic tools might be uh, available uh, when it comes to abnormalities in a corn plant. Our next study, we looked at uh, steel hybrids environment and planting dates, but now we were looking at the plot level. For this study, uh, we had about 60,000 plants that were individually assessed. We were looking at grain yield, abnormal ears percentage, and also ear placement. Some of the main takes, takeaways from this work is that about 7% of uh, ears were abnormal on this project. And also we, we were able to document that planting dates uh, had an influence in the issues that we were seeing happening. This in the x-axis, we have the planting dates that range from mid to late April, and it extended all the way to late May or early June, in some cases when the conditions were too wet for planting. We were working with six commercial hybrids from, uh, in this case, from Pioneer Seeds, different relative maturities. And what you can see here is that as we are moving to later planting dates, we were seeing an increase in the presence of abnormal ears. So that is an indication there. Uh, as we are getting out of that optimum planting window, we are taking a higher risk for uh, anomalies to occur, not only on this context, but, only, uh, but also in any other context. Our next projects is still hybrids environment, but now we complete to, we change to a completely different management strategy. Now we are looking at seeding rates. This was also plot level, and we individually evaluated about 63,000 plants, grain yield, abnormal ears, and ear placements. What we learned from this work is that about 8% of abnormalities occur in general terms. But you see here that some, in some conditions or in some uh, of the treatments, we had up to 80% of abnormalities. So that's very dramatic at that point. This study was conducted in four locations for two years. So we have a total of eight side years. And uh, over here, hybrid by seeding rate, what we can see is that uh, we have seeding rates ranging from 44,000 seeds per hectare all the way to 124,000 seeds. And uh, without worrying too much at the numbers, uh, 84,000 will be equivalent to 34,000 seeds per hectare, which is uh, the numbers that we like to use. So 34,000 here in the middle, anything below um, uh, will be a lower seeding rate per acre, and uh, to the right will be uh, high seeding rates per acre. What we were able to see is that some particular genetics or hybrids will show a decrease, uh, for example, when you are moving to higher seeding rates. Now, in some other genetics or hybrids, that will be the opposite. We will see an increase in abnormalities as we move to higher seeding rates. Just keep that information in mind as it helps us to shape and understand a problematic on corn management. These are some of the outcomes that we have been able to put together in addition to several extension articles, extension talks. This is work that we have been collaborating with other corn specialists, uh, Purdue, Peter Thomason as part of this, and Kansas State uh, and UNL as well. The main takeaways from this work is that uh, from multiple years, abnormal years affect corn fields uh, we understand and we have made the disclaimer that it is essential to investigate the leading causes. We don't know if anything similar to that of 2016 in farmers fields can occur again. We also documented that some morphological characteristics of the plant can help us as diagnostic tools. We are clear that abnormal ears decrease grain yields, and with that, we will expect a decrease in profit, definitely. The selection of resistant uh, hybrids uh, is important, as well as appropriate management that can help us to adapt, mitigate, and manage some unfavorable conditions that we might be facing in our growing season. And uh, very important, uh, 
looking at abnormal ears as a result of interactions, genetics, environment, and management. So that's all I have over there. Uh, that, again, that was my most recent research experience, but also I see that there can be a lot of overlap, not necessarily on the same topic, but on the approach that was taken. I believe, as just as Dr. Lindsay was presenting earlier today, uh, we are here in applied research and extension, and the idea is to respond to our stakeholder needs. What are the questions that are being asked? What are the problematics? What are the, uh, what are the type of research projects that we can get established, whether on farm or university stations, uh, in order to make uh, knowledge going? So I would like to present this circle here, identify the concerns, that's one of the first steps. Uh, we also need uh, to work with collaborators, uh, that's industry, that can be university, that can be farmers, that can be extension. So all of that is important. We want to conduct research and hopefully answer questions. We need, as important as conducting the research, as important it is to communicate the results. We need to make sure that the results are spread and that they will be available uh, to hopefully understand better and uh, achieve higher productivity and higher profitability in our crop systems. We also acknowledge that uh, some of those issues that occurred in the past, they can come back again. So we need to be attentive and many times even proactive about keeping an eye open and getting some work uh, uh, going on, on that. And uh, collaborative efforts are always needed, as I mentioned earlier. In terms of Ohio, I come from Nebraska. I was there for the last three and a half years. Before that, I was in Kansas for a couple of years. So I have seen a little bit of uh, the Corn Belt uh, here in the US. And what I can say is that uh, Ohio seems to be a much uh, more dynamic uh, state in terms of agriculture. Uh, in Nebraska, you will drive for several hours and you will see corn or soybeans uh, in both sides of the interstate. Now, here in Ohio, uh, it's a little bit different. You will start to see some other dynamics. Topography is a lot different here and uh, quite a bit of livestock present. Integration on farming systems uh, is a larger opportunity here as well. So just keeping that in mind, some of the attention areas that uh, my program and we as agronomists need to keep eyes open in Ohio and maybe in other places also. That goes back to fertilizer applications. We know that we have new genetics, new hybrids, uh, new requirements, higher yields. Carbon credits, just a couple of weeks ago, I was at the Ohio Agribusiness Association Conference and at least two or three talks were tailored towards carbon markets, carbon, carbon credits, how that works. So this is a topic that needs attention. Certainly in Ohio, water quality has been a large concern uh, with the presence of the Great Lakes just around us, specifically Lake Erie. Biofuel uses is a, a evolving topic with the uh, more and better sustainability goals that we might have. Peasant disease pressure, we know there are many dynamics, weather dependent. Uh, Dr. Pierce Paul will be talking about that later. We, need, we know that we need to start thinking uh, out of the traditional methods and in that comes uh, maybe the addition of emerging crops, maybe integrating cover crops, not only in soybeans, but also in corn. We know there is a need for food grade crops. Uh, there are new technologies evolving uh, very often. So we need to keep eyes uh, on that and try to integrate that in order to increase our cropping systems efficiencies. We need to be always uh, attempt to what is happening in the market. As Dr. Lindsay mentioned, there are these market dynamics, they might change what is being farmed. More acres of corn, more, more acres of soybean, more acres of wheat. So it, it all depends. And also we need to keep in mind that in some cases uh, there might be cyclical cropping, depending on what we are talking about uh, for less acres or for more acres, depending on the time being. 
very particular for Ohio uh, wet seasons, wet springs or wet falls that can delay planting time, that can delay harvesting, that can delay planting a cover crop, that can delay terminating a cover crop. So all, all of these are things that we need to keep in mind and I will try to touch on, on my next uh, few slides. So now we are down to what research tells us, that is uh, what information is out there that can help us to better understand our uh, agronomic management in corn. And before jumping into some specifications there of corn management, uh, I think it's important to highlight this. Often we need to come back to the basics. We need to understand or better understand what happens from planting all the way to full maturity in corn, not only above ground, but also below ground and even internally within the plant uh, physiology. Some of the first steps, leaf initiation as early as uh, emergency, emergence big one. We have leaf growth and appearance that extends up to close to tasseling. We have uh, the reproductive uh, um, steps that come up and they start anytime between B4 and B6. That includes tassel initiation, that includes ear initiation. Uh, as you can see here, B5, B6 stage, you have a plant somewhere here. And if we go out there to the field, we will not see an ear being initiated, at least externally. But after some dissection, you can, we will be able to figure out that yes, there are many other processes happening within the plant level. Other steps, kernel initiation and kernel growth or grain filling period towards the end of the season. So anything that happens within this time window, whether it is management, whether it is weather, whether it is uh, chemical application, Anything that we do, hopefully we do it correct and hopefully we, we are getting the favorable conditions because anything in the middle uh, can affect our final uh, results, yields and uh, profits. Some of the things that we need to keep in mind there, yield components are happening at different times. Field scarring uh, is critical, the spray application timing. If we do it at the wrong time, we can have a dramatic negative results. Growth regulators, they go up and down in the growing season. Radi solar radiation availability is critical for yield. We have biotic and abiotic stresses that can happen anytime and that can give us some different outputs. Something important here also is making sure that we understand that growth is not necessarily the same than development. Growth is just a measure of size, 20 centimeters, 10 inches height, but development is a measure of the actual stage. This picture is taken in a commercial field, commercial hybrid, and you can see how much variability is going on in this couple of rows. This first plant here is about B5 stage, next one B2, B3, and B4. So if we have that particular scenario in the whole field, what stage are we assigning to that? Are we saying B2, are we saying B5? In whatever stage we decide to assign, that will likely drive our subsequent practices. If we are applying a fungicide, a tasseling, or if we are applying post-emergence herbicides, we want to keep that in mind and find some consistency. And uh, also uh, figuring that growth is not the same that development. This is an example here, a, a dissected plant at the B9 stage. Again, when you think about B9 stage, you, you think about a plant that is purely vegetating. But no, there is already uh, some of those reproductive um, organs are being developed already internally at the plant level, as you can see the tassel being formed. Corn agronomics, corn production is determined by several factors. Hybrid selection is one of the very first uh, steps that we can think of. We have crop rotations, cover crops. We can think on optimum planting dates. We can think on row spacing, growth regulators, optimum seeding rate, pest and disease control, nutrients availability, and favorable weather. This is not meant to be a full or complete list, but at least it's showing some of the 
main uh, processes that we need to think about. This is some work that I conducted in Nebraska. We were looking at yield, yield response to planting dates and seeding rates with multiple genetics, uh, multiple environments, two locations, three years. And on the y-axis, we are looking at grain yield. So 160 bushels all the way to 260 maybe up here. And what we see is that environment many times will dictate how much yield are we getting. We need to keep that. Uh, and then I highlighted this box here on 2019 because there was a significant drop on yield. And this was uh, due to a hail event. There was a heavy hail a storm uh, sometime in August or September uh, and it occasionated about, I don't know, maybe 40, 50% of leaf defoliation in that particular location. So we see, we see the output there. Now into some management here, we have different planting dates from mid to late April all the way to late May uh, or early June. And we see that the optimum planting seems to be that early May, which is also applicable to what we have here in Ohio. And planting early sometimes might be risky depending on the year, depending on what environmental conditions we have. And planting late definitely we start to see that decrease due to uh, narrower growing season. Certainly some hybrids do better than others uh, um, at any time, any point. Moving into seeding rates, again, we have also uh, primarily driven by locations, environments. This highlighted box here of grain yield is a significant drop. This is the all the way Western Nebraska. That means drier conditions and is non-irrigated location. So you see that there are some those of differences, but then on the other side, you have uh, locations where you can have pretty high yields, close to the 300 bushels, if you choose the uh, appropriate hybrid for that environment. Moving on, uh, grain yield seeding rates, we are ranging from 26,000 here uh, as example, 34,000 in the middle and 42,000 and more. So we see that the optimum seeding rate uh, is about that 34,000 range. Uh, in some instances, what you get with 26,000 can be comparable to 34,000 or also 42,000 can be comparable to 34,000, depending on the conditions. The main point that I want to draw here from this slide is that all of this is driven by multiple dynamics. Uh, it's driven by hybrids, the environmental conditions that we have, and management practices that we are uh, implementing in our, in our system. Hybrids and breeding, that's something that is continuously changing. I think it's pretty clear and obvious all the uh, good positive increases in yield that we have had over time, uh, different corn eras, uh, better adapted to stress resistance, improved pest management, improved soil quality, better emergence. All of those things help us to keep going up in, uh, in terms of yields over time. Pushing a little bit into particularly for Ohio, relative maturities uh, seems to be a very important topic as it was presented last year by uh, Peter Tomison. We know that um, one of the challenges for getting an adequate establishment of cover crops is the time window, how much time the crop has available to grow and have those benefits. We also know that in some um, circumstances, Ohio has wet springs, as I mentioned earlier, that's, a, that's a, already a target concern. And in those situations, when we go back to the toolbox, relative maturities can be a good strategy to mitigate or balance these two issues, as example. We know that the coming maturities for Ohio are 105 to 114 days, however, if we go back to the um, Ohio Corn Performance Testing Program, this has multiple locations across the state are around 11 or 12 spread in order to capture the differential conditions. We see that uh, there has been already interest on early season hybrids 
as well as a full season hybrid. We know that the full season hybrid or full season maturity uh, technically has a higher yielding potential. Now, if we are able to pick the right early maturity under a condition, particular condition, we can start to see that uh, better yield or maximum benefit. So it all depends. And all of these dynamics are different depending on where are we located in the state. And even across the road, what works best for a grower on the south side of the road might not be the same what works on the north side of the road. We know that there is variability. Uh, and elaborating a little bit more here on the ultra early corn, which is 90 to 100 days, as Peter called it, and versus commonly grown 104 to 109, we see that there is a yield penalty for doing that uh, early maturity or ultra early maturity corn. There is a yield penalty. Uh, there is lower grain moisture at harvest, which can be a benefit. There is higher test weight and there is a loss in the return. However, depending on why are we doing this, uh, there might be some additional dynamics. For example, some savings on grain drying, some savings if we are grazing cover crop. So that $63 loss might be compensated under the uh, specific condition that the farm uh, might be looking or targeting. And that's why I am highlighting here, it's critical to understand first, what are the goals of that farming system? And based on that, things can uh, build up from there. This is a summary from five side years. Uh, this is work from 2016 through 2018. So multiple years and a couple of locations here in Ohio. In terms of row spacing, we hear that there is there has been some work and interest on conventional 30 inches, that's the standard, but also there has been some inclination towards narrow, um, narrow spacing, 15 inches in this case. This small figure summarizes uh, some work that has been done before. And what we have in the y-axis is the yield advantage for 15 inch rows versus conventional, which is 30. Many times there is no significance. In some situations, there can be an advantage. And in some situations, there can be a disadvantage. So it all again depends on the, on the specific goals that we are uh, chasing, on the specific conditions. When are we planting? How are we doing it? What type of hybrids? Uh, so all of that becomes relevant in the decision making process. Some work that was done in Nebraska, they were not looking at 30 versus 15. They were actually looking at 30 versus 60 inches rows. And the interest of that was on the 60 inches spacing was to add some uh, interseeded cover crop. And with that, maybe look at some grazing benefits, soil health benefits, uh, perhaps more or less like capture. And the results are highlighted here, 30 inches, uh, gave the highest yielding result, statistically significant, and 60 inches had a decrease in yield, certainly, but again, it can enhance other opportunities. So just uh, things to, to, to consider here. In terms of planting density, there has been work done, and what we can see here uh, on the x-axis going from 10,000 plants per acre all the way to 50, 55,000 plants per acre for hybrids released in different eras. New hybrids from 2012, 2016, they tend to have a high yielding potential due to breeding. And they also seem to show a wider optimum plant density interval. So more numbers that we can shoot while still maximizing yield. Now, when we look to the old hybrids, 1987, 1991, we tend to see that chart of a decrease right after the optimum rate. So uh, it seems to be a narrower window. Uh, and the main takeaway here is that optimum plant density can include a range of values. Uh, it's not only a silver bullet response, it can be actually uh, some, some several um, instances where we can achieve our best results. 
crop rotations, uh, Laura mentioned a little bit about it before, certainly there has been work done that indicates there are yield penalties when we are continuously cropping. Now, there are many reasons that can be dri driving the continuous cropping, either for corn or soybeans, in this case for corn here, uh, but there, there is an advantage of getting out of that, uh, of, of that system. So rotation benefits go back to soil structure, disease pressure, we break those cycles. Uh, there is a better management of corn residue. There is an increased nitrogen av availability, which can be one of the main benefits. This picture shows uh, some historical plots in Nebraska with a corn soybean rotation. This map here shows the effects, the negative effect. Anything that is red is a yield loss due to continuous cropping in the uh, US corn belt. And over here, we see that the effect gets magnified or the detrimental effect gets increased as the number of years increase with that continuous cropping system. So we want to uh, uh, make sure to have some crop rotations whenever it's possible and adequate for the farming system. Some of the yield gains have been driven uh, by different uh, aspects, but we see that high yielding environments have increased one point, about 1.4 bushels per acre per year, whether lower yielding environments are at about one bushel per acre per year. The main driving factors, kernel number. Uh, so it seems to be anywhere from 50 to almost 80% of those yield gains have been due to uh, more kernel number per unit of area. We need to acknowledge that there is variability uh, always field to field, even within the field. And as we look at, at a wider spectrum, such as this map here, uh, there are differences that can be uh, the result of changes in weather, for example, in 2012, optimum plant density for Ohio seemed to be close to 36,000 plants. And in 2018, that went down to 32,000. So just uh, aspects that we should consider. Moving on, I want to share a few highlights from the National Corn Yield Contest. Uh, there are those are entries above than 300 bushels per acre, and uh, numbers have been increasing over time. That's good news. That means that uh, there is progress happening. More than 400 entries in 2021. Uh, yield gains are higher for the National Corn Grower Association contest as compared to US average that is expected. Something interesting here is that row spacing has been stable. 90% approximately has been 30 inches, and there has been some interest in 15 inches, as you see here in the blue line. Plant population, you can achieve high yields with a wide range of uh, plant, plant rates. So it goes from 28 or 30,000 all the way to 48 or 50,000 plants uh, per acre. Planting date is very variable. Southern states will plant early. Northern states will plant a little bit later. Previous crop has been an important aspect on national corn entries, national corn yield contest entries. Uh, we see that soybean as a precursor of corn is the most common here with a 50%. Tillage practices, very variable. Even though there are some working still conventionally, uh, there are some that are looking into new uh, strategies, no-till, no strip-till, minimum tillage. So all those are good options for achieving high yields. Nitrogen timing, uh, for the sake of time, I, I am not touching on micronutrients, but uh, micronutrients can be important as well for maximizing yield. Nitrogen timing, when are we putting the nitrogen out? Uh, and we see that there is a nice spread on what is being done at the national level, uh, nitrogen at, at the spring, at planting, as a starter, as side rest. So there are several strategies that can, can, can work. And just as a matter of uh, note here, 602 bushels per acre was the, uh, is the highest record of corn, uh, and this was achieved by David Hula from uh, Virginia. Uh, some Ohio observations that I have here is uh, from the Ohio Corn Performance Test. I will just uh, go by very quickly for the sake of time. 
But basically, we want to account for environmental and genetic variability, replications in space and time. Altogether, we want to design productive and profitable options for uh, farmers and industry. These are the yield trends that we have been seeing for the last 50 years. The program has 50 years in existence and higher yields have been, uh, has been a must. And I think we are doing a good job on that and industry is as well producing, putting those genetics out. Transfer acre seeding rates have been increasing, definitely having uh, more plants per unit of area has been one of the drivers for higher yields. The percentage of emergence has been increasing over time. That's a good thing. Breeding efforts have been giving good results. Decreased lodging, very important, better standability. Transgenics and non-transgenics, there have been shift over time towards more or less. So we need to keep in mind uh, what rates are out there available and how can we uh, make them uh, suitable for our conditions. And referring to trades, uh, most of the uh, hybrid entries that we have had in the program, they come from two, three, or four trades together. That's probably due to resistances being built up in, in our crop. So the take home for today is that abnormal ears and lower yields, they have been a concern for the last several years. Applied research and extension can help us to solve some of those agronomic concerns. Collaborative efforts are a must. Research tells us many things, so we need to really fine tune uh, what works best for my particular condition, my particular farming system. National, national corn yield contest indicates that there are many strategies that can be implemented to shoot for very high yields. And from the Ohio observations, we just need to uh, be open and uh, uh, be active and proactive in terms of adopting new practices that can help us to maximize efficiencies in our uh, farming system. Uh, this a slide just shows some curiosities that I have been able to capture by walking cornfields all the way from Kansas to uh, Nebraska and now Ohio. And with that, uh, I think we might have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Osler. We do have one question so far. From Haley, um, Aaron Wilson, our climatologist, has mentioned that suitable field work days are decreasing in April and October, meaning our planting windows will be pushed back. Do you see the ultra early hybrids as an opportunity to plant late and harvest early due to the weather? Thank you, Aaron, for the question. So, yes. Uh, there are opportunities, and in fact, last year talk from Peter Thomason was all about the results of ultra early hybrids in Ohio. And uh, I did attend that talk, by the way, so I know a little bit of the highlights. I didn't do the work myself, but what I can say based on what I recall there is that yes, there are some conditions where um, you can still have uh, good yields, even with a uh, earlier maturity hybrid or shorter season hybrid due to conditions specific to Ohio. For example, the decreasing number of days available for suitable field work. And uh, not only that, to adapt to the new climate patterns, but as I mentioned, all, also those can be opportunities for diversifying the system a little bit better uh, in terms of having a more possibilities for plugging in a cover crop that uh, will hopefully not penalize corn yields, but at the same time, we can still capture those uh, services to the soil, to the nutrient cycling, to the environmental goals. Uh, so yes, uh, I think that ultra early or early season hybrids can be a tool uh, specifically here um, in Ohio and other regions as well. I don't see why not. Thank you. 